Good morning. Welcome to our studies in the book of James. If you have your Bibles, would you please open your Bible at James chapter 4. James chapter 4, and we're going to read from verses 1 through to 12. That's James 4, verses 1 to 12. Let's read God's word together. James writes, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask. And do not receive, because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions, you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. But he gives us more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother, or judges his brother, speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbour? Amen. And we thank God for his inerrant word to us this morning. Let's come before God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just bow before you with grateful hearts because you've given us another splendid opportunity to come together as your people, to look at your inerrant, infallible word, the word that you breathed out, the word you encouraged and blessed James to write for our edification. We thank you, Lord, for his work in producing this letter, a challenging letter, a letter that is full of practical guidance for Christian living. And we thank you, Lord, it is part and parcel of the canon of Scripture. And we thank you, Lord, that that canon is your inerrant word that speaks to our hearts in various and diverse ways. And so, Lord, as we turn into your word this morning, we ask, Father, that your spirit would move in our hearts or minds so that we would truly absorb what you have to say to us. Meet each individual need, we pray. Bless us and encourage us to be doers of the word, to take that word out into the streets, right out into the world. But also, Lord, teach us, encourage us, bless us to make disciples. Lord, it is a discernment we're failing at this time and have done so for many, many years. A failure to make disciples means a failure to produce men ready and willing to serve you. Oh Lord, how we need a change in our nation and that can only come about by a movement of your spirit across the nation. Lord, we pray for revival. Lord, what you've done in the past, you can do again. And we have every confidence, O oh Lord, that you know what's right and you know when and what you will do. But Lord, we don't. And we appeal to you, Lord, for revival. 
revival as it was in days past, to bring men and women into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, the examples are large and writ across our nation. We pray, Lord, that we would live to see it again. But we confess, O oh Lord, that we're a sinful people, a people whose thoughts are not always heavenly, who are always given over to the world and its pleasures. Lord, forgive us, we pray. Forgive us for deserting you and seeking the pleasures of this world when the pleasures of this world cannot satisfy. Lord, forgive us for every word, thought, and deed. Hold not these thoughts, words, and deeds against us, but cleanse us in the precious blood of Christ that was shed for sinners like us. Wash us, cleanse us, renew us, we pray, so that we may go henceforth with clean hands, clean heart, ever more willing to spread the gospel of Christ and grant us, O Lord, every blessing and encouragement for we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, we're turning into James chapter 4 this morning. The Athenian philosopher Plato is credited with saying, The good teacher does not write his message in ink that will fade. He writes it upon men. If that quote is accurate, then it says a lot about Plato his teacher Socrates, and his most famous student Aristotle. I wonder, did Paul, that well-educated Jewish man, who learned from the leading first century rabbinic authority, Gamaliel, have this in mind when he wrote these words to the Corinthian church? Are we beginning to commend ourselves again or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation, written in our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you're a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not in tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. One writer puts it this way, behind this passage lies the thought of a custom which was common in the ancient world, that of sending letters of commendation with a person. If somebody was going to a strange community, a friend of his who knew someone in that community would give him a letter of commendation to introduce him and to testify to his good character. Paul's critics constantly tried to undermine his apostleship demean his character, cast aspersions on his ministry and his motives, and he had no such letters of commendation. <clears throat> his retort was that each one of the Christian Corinthians was a letter of commendation, not only for him, but more importantly, for Christ. <clears throat> Just as letters convey a message, so too do our lives. What does a letter of your life say to others who read it? We don't often think about this, but people are watching us whether we realise it or not. They hear our words, they see our actions, observe our attitudes, and from these observations, people draw conclusions about us, about our values, about our beliefs, about what we do and where we go. And so they begin to build a character map of us, either for good or ill. And furthermore, if we are Christians, outsiders, let it be known, are making judgments about Christianity based on what they see in our lives. And sadly, there are some in the public eye who claim to be Christian, but leave an unfavourable impression upon unbelievers. They are seen as charlatans, hypocrites, counterfeit Christians. So is man good or evil? Now that's an age-old question. 
It's a question that scriptures provide an answer for, but not to the satisfaction of those who believe that man is inherently good. Well, if man is inherently good, how is it that some are such dreadful influences upon us? How does man explain away the fact that there is conflict in this world from minor disagreements to major wars with huge loss of life? Bring together two fallen creatures in an intense and intimate relationship like marriage. And even though both may be Christians, there are going to be times when they clash and disagree. Then add the birth of one, two or three or more little sinners who are completely self-centred. You then have a recipe that guarantees there will be numerous collisions of wills and wants. The recipients of James' epistle were all subject to the temptations and sins of this age. They struggled with getting along with each other, struggled with class distinctions, struggled with envy, selfish ambition and disorder. Their level of internal conflict was so fierce that James exposes their bent towards fighting, quarrelling, murdering each other, though the latter likely is hyperbole. Did they realise their behaviour was unbecoming as Christians? Did they realise the Lord gives more grace so that Christians need not live as though they were pagans? message is not culturally relevant, indeed is very relevant today. Has there ever been a day when there has been more fighting, fussing and fuming in churches? Those outside the Christian community often laugh and amuse themselves at the expense of so-called Christian conflict. Division and fractured characterise more churches than not. You know, it said, if you want a really good fight, join a Presbyterian church. The question is, is there a solution to such a condition? Well, God's inspired, inerrant and infallible word has numerous say to say why conflicts do occur. As well as how we should deal with them when they do arise. So two heads this morning. The first is the root of the problem, and secondly, overcoming the problem. Firstly, the root of the problem. Sometimes on a brief cursory reading of these verses, Christians misunderstand the intent of James' words. He's not talking about conflict in Afghanistan or the Straits of Hormuz. He's not informing us what causes the rise of tyrants like Hitler, Stalin, Mao Zedong, Pol Pot or others? James is writing to the church. He's not addressing the world. He's addressing believers. He's talking about quarrels and conflicts that are up within the local church as well as in the wider church. And James tells us something very interesting and quite sobering regarding the genesis of most church conflict. He says, it's the war within the human heart which causes clashes within the church. There have been great spiritual conflicts in the past, of course. For instance, Augustine of Hippo versus the heretic Pelagius. Martin Luther's refusal to recant his teaching at the Diet of Worms and thus launched the Protestant Reformation to name two but many. Most church conflicts are not about weighty and worthy issues, issues that are really worth fighting for, such as the doctrine of justification, the integrity of marriage between one man and one woman, not in between anything, men and men and women and women and even going so far as to marry a dog if you want, or the sinner and salvation and other great reform doctrines. Most church squabbles erupt over very small matters. Music and worship, building projects. Oh yes, <coughs> these are big to certain people, but the small in the whole scene of things a desire to run 
return to the good old days. And of course, the great bloodletting over the decker and the colour of a new carpet. The internal conflict James has in mind is conflict with God. He's saying that enmity with God leads to enmity with others. And he's saying that our passions are at war within ourselves. In verse 1, the authorised version translates the Greek word head-on as lusts. New King James and the NIV has desires. The Bible has pleasures. And the RSV and the ESV has passions. And that Greek word Hedon gives us the English word hedonistic. Now it can be used positively in terms of finding pleasure in godly pursuits, but in our text here, James uses the term to mean insatiable lust or desire for something without regard to restraint or discipline. Now let's be clear, he's not suggesting pleasure is wrong. We can find pleasure in a thousand different things without falling into sin. A walk in the park, watching our sunrise or a sunset, playing with our children or grandchildren, eating a meal with friends, so on and so forth. The problem comes when we become totally pleasure orientated. Even good things can become sinful when the pursuit of pleasure is for our own self-satisfaction without regard for God and others. One scholar notes pleasures are fine until allied to and at the service of a sinful nature. Consequently, the sinful self setting its heart and this satisfaction or that will not allow anything to stand in its way. James is saying the root of conflict is a human desire to possess what another person owns. When people talk about arguments they are participating in, invariably they seek to put a positive spin upon the reason for the clash of opinions. Thus they make noble claims about the church's best interest, and they are putting forward all this with the right motives and the right self-sacrifice, when more often that's not always the case. Please look at verses 2 through to 4. You desire and do not have. So you murder, you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. As we've seen over these last few weeks, James doesn't pull his punches. He can very blunt at times. And here he wades in again. So you murder. Now, they didn't engage in little wars and literal murder. James is probably thinking what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. The Apostle John will write later, everyone, hate, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. It appears that hostility and hatred are the crimes James has in mind. And he uses hyperbole by using these two words, war and murder, in order to get their attention. Benedict Spinoza, the Dutch Jewish philosopher, grew up on the edge of a Christian community near Amsterdam. He commented in what he saw going on around him in Christian churches with these words. I've often wondered that persons who make boast of professing the Christian religion, namely love, joy, peace, temperance and charity to all men, should quarrel with such rancorous animosity 
and display daily towards one another such bitter hatred that this, rather than the virtues which they profess, is the readiest criteria of their faith. Another word James uses in verse 2 is covet. And this is another indication of the fallen human heart. God gave the Israelites a gift a great gift when he provided them with the Ten Commandments. It was a window into things that really matter for living in a fallen world with fallen people. Now, the first nine are certainly not easy to keep and nobody's suggesting they are. But the Tenth Commandment is quite different. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. You shall not covet. Coveting is a process of the inner. It can't be seen by enmity bar God, but its results can be positively lethal. And the meaning of covet is to delight in, earn for, lusting after, it's about craving something you don't possess or can't have. If you look at something and think that you must have it and believe you can't live without it, then you are coveting. When you covet, your affection and deepest desire displace the one who's entitled to occupy that honoured place in your heart, and that is God himself. And the third symptom I wish to draw your attention to is an important one. It's being carnal-minded and not heavenly-minded. James is criticising the hostilities of his recipients. He knows they're being driven by internal motives. They crave what they don't have, then try to obtain it by methods that dishonour God. And that includes intimidation and hatred. Remember the first disciples of Jesus were John and Andrew. They had been disciples of John the Baptist for some time. But when the Baptist pointed Jesus out to them, they left the Baptist and began to follow Jesus. We read this in John's Gospel. Jesus turned and saw them following him and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, where are you staying? It sounds as if Jesus is asking if they need some direction. But it's a very relevant question to ask in the time of Jesus. Were these two men legalists looking for subtle and obscure conversations about minutia details of the law? like the scribes and Pharisees? Or were they nationalists looking for a political demagogue and military commander who would lead them to take on the occupying power of Rome? Or were they humble men of prayer looking for God? Or were they simply puzzled, bewildered, sinful men looking to learn more about God? These men got it right when they said to Jesus, Rabbi, where are you staying? They wanted to be with Jesus, end of discussion. And that answer is a missing ingredient in lives a lot of believers, says James. So many don't really know what they want. So what do they do? They want what everybody around them wants. They become like everybody else. And James says that's a dangerous disease and he calls it friendship with the world. Look how he addresses them in verse 4. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. James is not addressing those out with the church. He's not standing on the street corner screaming at people as they go past you adulterous people. He is addressing those in the church who aver that they are Christians. 
adultery is a violation of a marriage covenant. The love that has been pledged to a spouse is given to someone else. And devastating as that is, it's clear in James' mind something is more significant. And that something more significant is spiritual adultery. In the Old Testament, the relationship between God and his people is often portrayed in terms of a marriage union. God is the husband. Israel is his wife. And this most Yahweh tells, instructs Hosea to marry a prostitute in order to serve as a picture of God's faithful to his promiscuous people. And just as Hosea's wife went back to her lovers, so the Israelites continually committed spiritually adultery with the false gods of their neighbours. Jesus used the same kind of imagery when he said, forever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. And the rebuke here in verse 4 draws on these Old Testament images and the words of Jesus, which James puts together. The adulterous relationship is with the world. God is the faithful husband and the carnal world is the illicit lover. And the truth of the matter is that our ultimate allegiance is with one or the other. We can't entertain both. The Saviour said, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You can't place your ultimate hope in both God and money. You can't be firm friends with both God and the world. The world is opposed to God. Therefore, it's an act of spiritual adultery to claim allegiance to God while coveting and pursuing the pleasure should serve as a wake-up call to anyone who's flirting with the pleasures of this terrestrial globe. It may mean that you are merely a hearer of the word and certainly not a doer of the word. It indicates then that your faith is a dead faith, that your wisdom is not from above but from below. And if you come to church thinking you're a friend of God, but your real passion is for the things of this world, then, my friends, I pray this verse will show you your dire situation, that you need to repent by turning to Christ and mending your ways. Secondly, overcoming the problem. The carping, fighting, quarrelling, and bad behaviour found in the church that James had looks no different from what goes on in the world. And that's his whole point. Stop. Take a good look at your behaviour. Examine your own lifestyle. Does your life look anything like that of Jesus Christ? Does your life abound in the fruit of the Spirit? If not, almost certainly, you have a lifestyle is tied to this world. But know this, Jesus Christ died to deliver you from the prince of this world. He died to deliver you from Satan's sin and death. He died to give you forgiveness of sin and eternal life. Charles Wesley wrote, his death is my plea, my advocate see, and hear the blood speak that hath answered for me. He purchased the grace which I now embrace. O Father, thou knowest he hath died in my place. Can you say that? With absolute conviction, Christ died in my place. Are you truly aware that Christ died in your place and you have embraced him and deserted the world. Please look at verses 5 and 6. Or do you suppose it is no purpose that the scripture says, 
he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Scripture tells us, God is righteous and jealous. He knows that the world offers shoddy substitutes. Counterfeit. Rubbish that will disintegrate and go to dust. All these kind of things that the world offers will never bring lasting satisfaction. But God can give you something that is both for now and eternity. He can give you something that the things of this world can never come close to replicating. And that's why he demands our undivided allegiance. God's grace is the antidote to conflict. The same God who demands our undivided allegiance gives us grace to help us so that we may be able to do what he requires of us. Our carnal pleasures lead to sin and destruction. And James calls us not to look to the world for our pleasures. Instead, we're to cherish our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ above all things. Do you remember Oliver Crummel's great words in a letter to the Kirk's General Assembly on the 3rd of August, 1650? Things were kind of difficult. The threat of war. Cromwell had already marched north over the border. And in his letter to the assembly, he said, I beseech you in the bowels of Christ, think it possible you may be mistaken. There is tension, fighting, argument, conflict. How do we see it? It's always the other person who is wrong. Please consider that it may be you who is wrong. Is your life lived in submission to God and his word? If that word contradicts your traditions, your prejudices, Will you ask for forgiveness and grace to bring your lifestyle, your behaviour into line with that which the word teaches? Are you standing proud with the world or are you living humbly before your creator and redeemer by his grace? James is giving us practical instruction. Oh yes, it can be hard to bear. Who likes being told they're adulterous? Who likes being told they're wrong? But James has a purpose, and it's a God-given purpose, to encourage us to turn our backs in the world and to look to God for all things, for all our needs, for time, and for eternity. So may we all be living by God's grace and giving him the glory. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for your goodness and mercy. Lord, at times the words of James, blunt and hard as they are, are a lesson for us to learn, to take on board, to embrace, that we would grow in the grace and knowledge of your Son. Grant us, O oh Lord, that we would truly learn, truly understand, truly forsake the world for Christ and Christ alone. For we ask these things in his wonderful name and for his sake. Amen. Well, my friends, that brings us to the end of another day. 
please stay safe. Please keep well. And God willing, we'll meet again next week to carry on in our studies of James. Blessings and bye.